Welcome to our, our panel on the economics of cybersecurity. We're, we're blessed to have a, a great team here from the University of Maryland, which is going to uh, help show you why economics matters to all of us in the cybersecurity world. Um, I, I was lucky enough to uh, work with Larry when he was in charge of all of us PhD students at the University of Maryland. And so uh, it was, it's fun when you get into the cyber world to reach back into some researchers that have been doing some outstanding work on cybersecurity and on accounting and information assurance since the late 90s, I would say, but maybe it's the... Um, but we, we've got uh, the Larry uh, is going to be starting out, and then uh, Marty and Lay and I will all uh, come up onto the panel and have some discussion. So we'll, we'll have an a, a overview, and then we'll go into the panel discussion. So without further ado, Marty. I mean, I'm sorry, Larry. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you folks. Uh, so l let me give you a little background first. So 20 years ago, uh, I was taking economic models and applying it to accounting and finance. My PhD is in economics with a mathematical focus from Rensselaer. Any Rensselaer grads here? Engineers, any engineers here? Okay, so you know Rensselaer is. Uh, and uh, somehow I stumbled upon the notion of cybersecurity and discovered there were no economic models for how much to invest in cybersecurity. I thought that was an important issue. How much do you want to invest in cybersecurity? I see all these companies that are having breaches, okay, and I read these articles back, go back 20 years ago, 1998, 99, okay, and they talk as if all these companies are going to go bankrupt, right? As, as it turns out, they don't. I'll come back to that later on. Uh, and so what I started thinking was, so, so how much should they invest? A company like Targets can't take all their money and put it into cybersecurity. That's not their business. So there's got to be some decision rule for how much they're going to invest. So that's how I got into it. And very quickly, once we got into it, actually NSA heard about our work and started supporting us. They came to us. Uh, and since then, we've actually had support from DHS, okay, and I'm currently being supported to some extent uh, by NSF. So I'm actively involved. It changed my whole career because I stumbled on this area that no one was doing any work with economics. I immediately went to one of my colleagues who's sitting up front here, Marty Loeb, and told him what I was interested in. And at first he says, I'm not interested, but finally I got him interested in it. Okay? And uh, so we actually developed an economic model called uh, a model for how much to invest in cybersecurity. And the literature, we did not name it, but the literature started calling it the Gordon Loeb model. So I'm going to talk about that model, but I'm going to talk about how that model can help okay, to implement some of what's going on with NIST. So, but before I tell you that, let me just say one quick story that I think might resonate with some of you. So about, oh, I'd say 17 years ago, uh, I, I got a call from someone who was in charge of security for a Fortune 500 company, right? And he wanted to put in, this is maybe 17 years ago, he wanted to put in an upgrade to the uh, network, the security of the network, and he went to see the CFO and asked for a $10 million upgrade. And the CFO said, where's your business case? And this person who came to see me, I have a standard policy, I'll, the policy will apply to all of you as well. If you want to talk to me about anything I'm talking about here, I'll be glad to buy you lunch if you come up to the campus. All right? Uh, and so uh, he came up to campus, we had lunch, and he says, doesn't the CFO understand the importance you know, of security for the, for the internet? And I said, of course he does, but don't you understand economics? You know, and if he gives you that money, he's taking it from somewhere else. So it's a resource allocation decision. And that's what we're all about. We talk about how much do you allocate to cybersecurity. What's the real cost of a cybersecurity breach? If I asked you folks, I haven't gotten to my slides yet, okay? But if I asked you folks to tell me, can you name a company that went under? I know we've got a lot of computer science people here, engineers. Can you name a company that went under uh, during the financial, financial crisis of 2008? Can anyone name a, any company that you know of that went under as a result of the financial crisis of 2008? Lehman Brothers, perfect. Can you name a major corporation that went under because of a cybersecurity breach? We've got computer science people here. <laughs> Let me try that. Can't name one major corporation. <laughs> so when we had the ex so what I keep saying is, I hate to see companies have breaches, but what? Well, are they a company listed on the New York Stock Exchange in the U.S.? Okay. 
Well, the point I like to always make is we need a big company that everyone's aware of. You're, I'd have to go check that one out. All right, was that, a, was that really went under? It wasn't from cybersecurity, but was it? I'd have to check that out. The point I'm trying to make is, okay, that these breaches are really significant. They're important. They cost companies money. But until we have a major corporation that really goes under, we don't seem to get the attention of everyone. So let me tell you what, what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. Are most of you familiar with the NIST framework? So I'm not going to read you my slides. I put together some slides that... Uh, if Andy wanted to put it on the web, that way you'll have something you can look at, okay? So, we all know that the NIST framework was the result of President Obama's executive order, right? That President Obama in 2013 uh, tasked NIST to come up with the cybersecurity framework, gave, the, gave NIST one year, NIST within one year, came up with the framework, right? Uh, and so the framework actually came out, okay, well, let me go back one. The framework actually came out in 2014, right? And since then, they've updated it, and I'll talk more about it. And the framework immediately took off. I was involved in meeting with some of the people in NIST, talking about the framework, and quite honestly, my attitude was this will never take off. So if you think I know, if you think I think I know everything, obviously I don't, I was wrong, okay? But one of the things that happened that really uh, gave the NIST framework a tremendous push Okay, and that was when President Trump, in Executive Order 13800, said all government agencies have to use the NIST framework. The externality or the spillover effect from that was that all companies that want to do business with the government better be using the framework or some framework that's consistent with it. And as a result of President Trump's Executive Order 13800, we now see everyone talking about the cybersecurity framework. And so the framework, what is it made up of? Okay, so the framework basically talks about core implementation tiers and profiles. And I won't define these for you, but what I'm really interested in is the implementation tiers right down here. Okay, and if you just take a look at that little sign there, they basically have four tiers. And what NIST talks about in their framework is that you don't have to be at tier four, even though a lot of companies think they have to be there, but it's really a cost-benefit decision on whether you're tier one, tier two, three, or four. But they never explain how you can do cost-benefit analysis to decide what tier. In fact, just the opposite. I've had the head of the NIST framework come to my class and talk about this, and what he basically argued was, it's up to each company to decide how to implement the different tiers. And that, on the surface, makes a lot of sense, but there's no guidance at all in how you'd come up with a cost-benefit framework. So when I heard that, my first thought was, well, maybe you can use our model as a framework to, you know, for companies to look at how to come up with the right tier. So that's what this talk is really about, using our model for how to go through and figure out what tier is best for us. Keep in mind, it's a cost-benefit decision. Right? So you can just look at this, the tiers. Basically, the tiers go from tier one up to tier four, and the difference is in terms of rigor and sophistication of the tiers. Of course, what that means also is there's a difference in cost. As you get more rigorous and more sophisticated, as you move up in tiers, you have more care, more costs. NIST explicitly, explicitly points out, okay, that if you want to move up from one tier to the next tier, okay, it's a cost-benefit decision. You make the decision how to do it, but it's a cost-benefit decision. Every company doesn't have to be at tier four. And in fact, for small companies, it probably doesn't make much sense. Or certainly, they can't afford it on a cost-benefit basis, right? So, what I've got here is, if you just take one minute and take a look at this, basically what NIST is saying is that you've got to ask yourself, how much should our organization invest in cybersecurity risk management? Keep in mind, for different tiers, you gotta invest more. But nowhere does NIST tell you or give you any kind of guidance. They purposely do not give guidance. And the reason they don't, for good reason, and that is they feel it's up to you as a company to decide how you're gonna go through your cost-benefit analysis. 
right? But they explicitly say in several different places, if you read, okay, version 1.1, the second version, originally came out 1.0, they explicitly say it's a cost-benefit decision, all right? So my thought was, well, I agree with that, but the question really is, for companies trying to con come up with what tier, you know, how can they go through this? So the first thing I thought about was, so for different tiers, it's going to cost you different amounts as you move up in tiers. And depending on your, it, it's company dependent. So companies have to decide how much would it cost me to get to a different tier level, right? And then they have to ask themselves, okay, uh, how much are we spending right now and is it worth going to the next level? And that's a cost. You know, what's the incremental benefits versus the incremental cost? Basic economics question, right? So that's how I got interested in it, and I turned around, and I said to Marty, okay, and to Lay, I said, we can apply the model to the NIST framework in terms of tiers, right? So that's the whole purpose of this little discussion. All right, so one of the things I often get accused of is that, well, you're lost in your models, okay? And in the real world, you know, can you really use these things, okay? And the answer is, I fully understand that a model should be considered as something that you use as a supplement to, not I mean, as, a, as, a, as a complement to, not as a, as a substitute for some sound business judgment or sound decision making. So in other words, you think of these models as being a complement to, not as a substitute for making these decisions. And the reason I have this little slide up here is I want you to know that the Wall Street Journal agrees with that. They asked us to write a paper on the Gordon Lowe model. The Financial Times agrees with that. The uh, Better Business Bureau in 2017 came out with a report and recommended for all small businesses within North America to consider using the Gordon Lowe model as a framework. Now, I know my wife would say if she were here, well, that's typical Larry. He's one of the, you know, how great the model is. But I'm just trying, I'm trying to let you know that it, people outside of academia have recognized that the framework, and I think of the model as a framework, the framework is valuable. Although the model itself is a mathematical model that actually uses some calculus to get to solution. But it's the framework of the model that really is so valuable as I see it. All right, so that's, that's a little of the mathematics of it. I'm not going to discuss it. All I'm going to say is that there's some mathematics. If you want to go back and read the original article, which was published in uh, the ACM Transactions on Information System Security, a major computer science journal, that was all mathematics, right? Excuse me? TSEC, yeah. exactly. All right, so anyone who's in computer science, they know that, what that journal is. Okay. But the basic idea of the model is, what you're saying is that there's an expected loss associated okay, with, with a breach. And that loss is based on the vulnerability, okay, and I'm using vulnerability to include threat, so vulnerability and threat, so my V is a vulnerability, okay, multiplied by the expected value of the information you're trying to protect. That's kind of your expected loss, right? And so if you can invest more money, what you should be able to do is reduce that vulnerability. So the basic little mathematics here basically says, look, if you multiplied the vulnerability times the, expect the value of the information, you get the expected loss. If you invest more money, you reduce that vulnerability, and that reduces the expected loss. And that helps you to figure out how much to invest, which we call Z. So that's all that math says. Right? And there are three major components of this. One is, what's the value of the information you're trying to protect? Right? Uh, what's the vulnerability in terms of vulnerability, probability of a breach? So I tend to think of vulnerability and threat as a probability of a breach. So that's the intuition there. And then lastly is, what's the productivity of making more investments? So you need a productivity function. If I invest more, how do I reduce V? So that S of ZV is really a function that talks about how I can reduce V. It's the productivity of additional investments. So that's the idea underlying the Gordon Loeb model. All right, so basically what it says is these benefits from investing more are increasing at a decreasing rate. Simple economics, basic economics, you know, diminishing marginal returns, right? And what it also says is that you can actually figure out that there is some optimal level of investment through mathematics. 
and that's what we did, but that's not what I want to talk about. All I want to say is that intuitively, if I invest more money, I can reduce the vulnerability, right? But I reduce it as I invest more money, okay? The reduction gets smaller and smaller. The reduction, the benefits are increasing at a decreasing rate, right? And there's some point where it doesn't pay to invest anymore. And when I talk to people in computer science, you know, before we talk about economics, they'll often say, well, keep investing up to the point where you expected loss. But that's not true. What you want to do is you want to take into consideration the function for increasing at a decreasing rate. So assuming you pick your initial investments wisely, okay, you'll get more for your money initially than later on. All right. So forget about the mathematics, but the point of this slide is to say, so now we decided, okay, we're going to integrate our model into the NIST framework. And I'm going to eventually show a little graph that'll sum it up. All right, so skip those two, all right? And we made up an example. And we made up an example that includes what we call the productivity function. And so if you look right here, that's the productivity function. And what that basically says is, without going through the mathematics, it says, if I invest more money into cybersecurity, I reduce V by some certain amount based on this function. So the, is the intuition clear? So that's what it's saying, okay? All right, so what this slide shows, and then I got one more after this, okay, actually two more, okay? What this slide shows is, so let's say the vulnerability is 30%, 0.3, all right? I can then say, okay, for different levels of value of information, I can compute the optimal amount to invest. So what this slide shows is the optimal amount to invest, the curves, at different, at different Vs, v, okay, V equals 0 0.5, 0 0.3, and so on. So it shows at different, at different Vs, right? Okay, I can actually figure out what would be the optimal level of investment depending on the value of the information I'm trying to protect. And as the value of the information gets greater as I move along here, okay, so that I'm investing more. And I can also, let's go back to what I said 10 minutes ago. I can also start off and say, so for our company to get to tier one or tier two or tier three, how much do I think it's gonna cost? So what we've got over here is we've got, uh, this is for tier one, tier two, uh, yeah, tier two, tier, th uh, yeah, do I have it? Tier three and four, right here. Tier, tier one, two, three, and four, right there, all right? So now what I can do is I can see where am I in terms of how much I'm investing, okay, at an optimal level relative to the different tier levels. And does it pay to increase it? So let me take one of those and isolate it so it'll make it a little clearer. So what I've got here is, okay, a slide that shows if vulnerability is 0.3, okay, I can then plot a curve that would show me, okay, show us how much I want to invest an optimal level of investment at different levels of value of information. If I plot against that, how much it costs for our company to get to tier one, two, three, or four, I can see where I fall, you know, in terms of what tier and whether or not it pays to invest any more to get to the next tier level. Now, it all is based on your estimates of your company, so I'm not taking away the notion that you make the decision in your company. In fact, what you can do is a simulation around this. You can try different levels. But at least you have a way to try to implement the NIST framework in terms of tiers on a cost-benefit basis. Now, I know I went through a lot quickly, so let me just summarize and say, Okay. There are some key insights to all this when you think about you know, what the model shows us. You know, the key components are the, you know, what I've got up here, potential losses, vulnerability threats, productivity investments. Uh, we have some conclusions which you don't have to worry about. Basically, we showed that on average, one of the key ones is, on average, you don't want to invest okay, more than 37% of the initial expected loss. We can prove that mathematically, and we do. That's in the article. If anyone's interested, send me a note. I'll be glad to send you some papers, okay? And, uh, 
Okay. One reason I put this in is I don't want you to think I'm lost in the model. I understand it's a framework. And I understand how you're going to apply it in your company, or anyone's company, will be a little differently. But the framework is very useful. So what I like to do uh, is, well, let me go back once, just one more time. I like to go back and let it just dance one more time. I really, I really believe that economic models should be viewed as a complement to and that as a substitute for sound business judgment. I am not lost in the model. Right? Now, there are four steps you can follow to use our model. And rather than me going through these, I'm going to ask for some help. I got a three minute video that's going to show you how you could use the model, which I made. It's a YouTube video. I'm sure the other one was very good, but I think this is better. <laughs> ah, that's me. Okay. Can I see that? The photo's better, right? <laughs> Cybersecurity breaches are common in today's interconnected digital world. Anyone who doubts this claim need only ask Target, Home Depot, J.P. Morgan Chase, or the U.S. government. Despite the risk to a corporation's earnings and reputation, not to mention the potential liability and loss of secret formulas, corporations tend to underinvest in cybersecurity for several reasons, including the fact that hackers are invisible. You won't see them standing outside your window. Furthermore, you don't know where or when they will attempt a cyber attack. Another reason firms tend to underinvest in cybersecurity is because these investments result primarily in cost savings rather than generating revenue growth. The above notwithstanding, corporations need to invest in cybersecurity. Fortunately, there is a framework that can help firms derive the appropriate amount to spend in protecting their information from cybersecurity breaches. The literature has baptized this framework as the Gordon Loeb model. The fundamental principle underlying the Gordon Loeb model is that when making cybersecurity investments, the benefits should be greater than the costs. In deriving the appropriate level of spending, the Gordon Loeb model takes into account the potential loss from a cybersecurity breach, the probability of a breach, and the way cybersecurity investments reduce the probability of a breach. Based on the framework, there are four steps that organizations should take to determine the cybersecurity spending. Step one, segment information sets and assign each set of value. In other words, estimate the value of the information you are trying to protect. Step two, Estimate the probability that an information set will be breached and assign each set a vulnerability score. Step three, develop a grid ranging from low value, low vulnerability to high value, high vulnerability information sets. By combining steps one and two, you end up with the expected losses for the different information sets in your grid. Step four, Put your cybersecurity dollars where they be most productive in terms of reducing the expected losses from a cybersecurity breach. When taking the fourth step, keep in mind that the benefits from investing in cybersecurity increase at a decreasing rate. Two general findings from the Gordon Loeb model are, first, cybersecurity spending generally should not exceed one third or roughly 37% of the total expected losses from cybersecurity breaches. Second, the optimal amount to spend to protect information does not always increase with increases in an information set's vulnerability. Although not a panacea, the Gordon Loeb model should go a long way toward helping a firm derive its cybersecurity investment needs. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to end up by just saying, uh, I know I get accused of being lost in this model, okay, and I get accused of, can someone really use it in the real world, okay, and my answer to that is, uh, if you don't believe Hello, me, Wall Street Journal, Today we'll be talking about security investment models.
Better Business Bureau in so the, the report overall view recommended the overall model. Overall view of the slides here to first we're going to introduce the canonical method. model for security investments, which comes from Gold Um Then we will talk about a subsequent video, oh, uh, some yeah. simplified investment models. Uh, yeah. Now you go to get here. So we will we'll start out with some discussion, but then uh, if if there starts to be some questions that, that you all have, we will be uh, be ready to take some some questions. Since I gave the talk, I would suggest you talk to them for the questions, especially <laughs> the tough ones. The easy ones I'll take, but we'll give them the tough ones. So before you go in, I should have mentioned one thing. Although it's the Gordon Loeb model, since then we've published a ton of papers related to it, uh, and Joe Lay. Uh, or as we call her, Lay. Lay has actually been a key part of all those publications. She's an integral part of everything we've done right after we developed the model. Thanks. Well, um, obviously interested in any comments you have, but one of the things that comes to us is when you think of them recommending this model for small businesses, what about varying countries and using this model for, for country investment versus company investment? So I've given this talk in the Netherlands, I've given this talk in the UK, I've given this talk in Japan. Uh, in Japan, for example, it was to engineers and computer scientists. In the Netherlands, it was a group like this group. Uh, so they apparently think that this model has some use. And every one of those talks has been about uh, what I call insights from the Gordon Loeb model, how you might be able to use it. Okay, so I think it has, you know, it's, it's a framework. Let's go back, the framework says what? Well, it says you gotta consider, this is, this is just intuition. You gotta consider, okay, the value of the information you're trying to protect. You gotta consider, okay, the vulnerability to a breach, okay? And then you ask yourself, do I wanna put more money into it? Do I wanna invest more? And the way you make that decision is, so what do I get for extra dollars? What's the productivity of the investment? That's our productivity function. So my answer would be, and I'll let them, is that absolutely this has uh, application to any kind of you know, environment, private corporations, you know, uh, small companies, government agencies. Uh, I've been contact we've been contacted by almost every major US government agency to talk about it. Anything? You're talking about a country protecting itself, national defense. We, you know, we have in the model basically a could be a, a large loss, but something that's finite. We can at least estimate when you're talking about loss of life and then losing the whole country as a whole. You know, there are limitations to the model. Lee, you want to add in? Uh, I think the whole idea about the model certainly apply to most countries. I would say it's an economic decision. Um, what, dif what would be different in different uh, culture, different nation, probably is the value of the information. For example, if we, we stay in Europe, then there's the new GDPR came out. So the personal information, personal data, once you lost it in Europe, probably it's gonna cost the company a lot more. And I think the United States is also following suit. But if you go to some other less developed country, then the L probably will be very different. Also, the vulnerability depends on the infrastructure. It will be different. So I think you have to, again, it's a situation country by country uh, approach. But the whole idea is pretty much the same. Yeah. So have you, as you're taking a look at what uh, we invest 37% for, we're a small company. But what about the differences with in sectors where you have a uh, more active uh, ISAC? Or what's the, how could you do a value of friends in this kind of a model? So with ISAC, right. uh, I gave a talk at the national meeting of the uh, financial services ISAC. And to me, they're probably the most, I, I don't mean to offend them, most sophisticated of the ISACs, or certainly among the most. Uh, and they're particularly concerned about this. And one of the things in, in their situation is, uh, when they think about breaches, you know, companies think about breaches differently in terms of risk. Uh, some companies think about the, the risk in terms of the expected loss. 
Others think about it as, what's the, uh, what's the smallest probability of a zero loss because any loss, the reputation effect is so damaging. And the financial sector, okay, financial services, Isaac, they're particularly concerned about that. So they put a high value on their information. And so remember, the expected loss, however you look at it, is a combination of the probability of a breach and the value. So it's a trade-off between those two. So one of the questions, it's not exactly what Andy asked, but was, so what about small companies? Okay, a lot of small companies uh, think that they're not vulnerable because uh, who's going to want their, you know, their assets or the, you know, their information? It could be just a list of their credit cards. Well, the answer is they're a soft target. So even though the value of the information might be lower, the, pr the probability of getting into them might be very high. So it's a, it's a trade-off between those kinds of things. Uh, you know, so, so that's why I say every company has to decide for themselves. The framework doesn't give you an answer for any company. It gives you an approach for your company. Does that make I would just for mention about the 37 percent was, was the maximum, okay, that, that there are for many, you know, in our mathematical model, for many parameters, it's quite a bit less than 37 right. percent. Maybe talk a little about how we came about. We had an optimal amount, a function of how much to spend, and then I don't know if Larry wants to talk about it, but Larry's we're looking for a decision rule. <laughs> so it was done by simulation, a lot of looking at changing the parameters, and a notice that it was never greater than one of the functions, thirty-seven percent. Once you have an idea that you can do something, that it, that there's a rule, then you look to prove it okay. mathematically. So if I can, can I tell? I can tell the story about the 37 percent. So, uh, so I teach a, a seminar at the doctoral level, and I cover some economic papers. And any of you know what real options are in economics? Uh, real options are, you know, that I can make a decision to invest now, or I can defer the investment. There's a, what they call a deferment option. And there was a paper published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics years ago by a well-known economist. Uh, and it was all mathematics, but at the end they came up with a decision rule. And the decision rule was, on average, uh, the net present value okay, has to be uh, at least equal to the cost of the project. So when Marty and I got into this initially, uh, and we were looking at the mathematics, I said to Marty, it should be obvious I'm the talker, they're the brains here, right? So uh, when, when, I got it, when we got into it, I said to Marty, we need a decision rule, and I referred to this paper, which he hadn't read, and I gave him the paper to read. And he says, that's crazy. You don't start off with the end result when you do research. And I said, I know that, but I says, we still need a decision rule. <laughs> and so we kept meeting for about nine months uh, every week for lunch to talk about this. And one day he walked in, and Marty's a good mathematician, and he walked in and he says, I got a Eureka. He said, that we, you know, we, we not only got closed form solutions, but I got a decision rule for you. It shows that, to be honest, what the answer really is, is you never want to invest more than one over E. Okay? So if you, that's what, 30, 36 point something percent. That's the mathematical solution. That's why we use 37 percent. And so we came up with my decision rule. We published this paper in a computer science journal. Okay, and for the next year, there are all kinds of papers coming out and say these people must be crazy. Okay, it's not possible two guys from the business school come up with a model that all of us in computer science could actually use. So they went through trying to disprove it, and they especially didn't like the decision rule. They really disliked that immensely. Uh, eventually, a mathematician from France and from Russia, around the same time, about three or four years after we published our original paper, uh, they both came out with articles and said something like the following. These guys stumbled on something that's far more powerful than they even realized. So I went into Marty's <laughs> office and I said, you know, they point out we stumbled on something far more. I said, maybe they're right, but Marty's a good mathematician. He says, no, they're wrong. The mathematics is right. And so what they actually did was they showed that the model was, was more generic than we had even thought it was. So uh, if anyone's interested, I'll be glad. You know, if you've got an engineering background or any kind of, you know, undergraduate background in calculus, something you can read this easily. It's, it's, it's easy, I, I mean, I was able to read it with no problems. So. <laughs> <laughs> and and develop with money. The question right here. And then we'll... 
Right. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, tremendous model. Really like it. Uh, I wonder if you could comment, uh, elaborate rather, maybe a little bit more about how you would go about determining what appears to be relatively, s or to include a lot of subjective components, uh, on either the, uh, the value of the information, okay, a lot of which would be stated in the negative, if I lost it, I lose reputation, something like this. So there's some, some difficult to quantify kinds of things there. Um, and then the, the cost of the cybersecurity. Uh, of course, when they had the WannaCry breach in May of 17, uh, that patch had been out since March, and a lot of the companies who were victims had not applied the patch, in large part because it takes a lot of staff, if you have a big network, to, to patch all those systems, and patches just keep coming. So you add people, uh, the biggest cost. So there's, an, so there's a lot of costs in cybersecurity that are difficult to measure. I mean, we could talk about the training requirements, et cetera, to bring people up to speed. So how would you get fidelity if you were running a business uh, on cost of cybersecurity? What would be the components of that? Have you looked into that? And what would be the components of the value of information, uh, particularly if that happens to be perishable? Thank you. You want me to answer it? So, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I, get this, I, I, get, I get this question on a regular basis, okay? So the beauty of my talk is I say, you know, I can tell you how to use the model, uh, and I can walk you through what you've got to consider, but you've got to tell me what your information is worth, and you've got to tell me what, it, you know, what you're doing already in cybersecurity and what you could add to that and what you think it would cost. It would be different for each company, okay? Uh, however, in terms of the value of the information, let me say we've done, the three of us have done lots of studies to look at the impact of breaches on major corporations that are publicly traded, and in that case, we've looked at the impact on the stock price. So that's one way for a publicly traded company, we've looked at the impact, and surprisingly, for most breaches, it's not statistically significant. There is a negative impact, but not statistically, for some companies it is, but the truth is, I don't have a, a crystal ball where I can tell you that here's how you do it, but I can walk you through it. And so the analogy I like to make, if I'm allowed to keep going, so for many years, <laughs> I was a consultant with IBM. I've always been a professor. My dad used to say, get out, you know, get out in the real world. So I did up to 15 days a year of consulting, and I was a consultant with IBM. Are any of you familiar with uh, net present value models? Okay, so a couple of hands went up. So net present value models require you to figure out the future cash flows, bring them back to the present value, and compare it to the cost of the investment. And so I'd go through these net present value models, and it was all engineers, okay, these were senior engineers, this is back before everyone was getting MBAs, okay, and I would talk about net present value, and they would say, well, how much should we put in the cash flows? And my answer was very similar to what I just gave you for the Gordon Loeb model. My answer was, I can walk you through it, but it's your product, you have gotta figure out what you could lose or what you could gain by going into this investment, all right? And I can walk you through the steps, things you can want to consider. I could do the same thing with our model, but the numbers you're gonna to have to come up with. So one of the things that a company in Washington, D.C. came up to Marty and I, a major consulting firm, and I was friendly with the owner of the firm, and basically what he said was, uh, why don't we take your model and go out to all my clients and you can tell them how much they should be investing in cybersecurity, all right? And what we'll do is we'll give you a very attractive consulting fee and we'll charge the client, okay? And that on the surface sounds like a, a nice idea. Uh, my reaction was, what are you, nuts? <laughs> no matter what number we give them, it's not gonna be the right number if they have a breach. What you wanna do is, and we don't wanna do it, we weren't looking for consulting, what you wanna do is you wanna explain to them how they can use the framework, how they can do it in their own company. So that way, okay, if there's a mistake, it doesn't work out, they're responsible for it. And remember, all these models of expectations are based on what we call distributions. So if I could have 100 repeat, repeated trials, it'll work out nicely. That would be the equivalent of saying, if I could put my model into your company for 100 years, it should work out better than not using the model but I'm not gonna get 100 years. You have one big breach, the number's wrong. So 
Uh, so the answer is, I can walk you through how you'd go through coming it up with your company, but I would never give you a number. I might tell you, well, let's look at the stock value of your company, okay? And if you had a big breach, what do you think you might lose? You know, what might happen to your stock? We, we do have evidence of what happens to company stock, right? We can look at the percentage you might lose on average. Might lose 2%, tell me what that's worth to you. So there's some, we can certainly walk through and say, what kind of security do you have right now? What could you do to, you know, complement that by adding to your security? What do you think it would cost in your company? So I could walk you through it, but I would not give you the numbers. Because whatever I gave you, whatever, whatever numbers you come up with, someone over here in another company will come up with different numbers. Does that make any sense? I can probably add something related, not, although probably not directly on the point. So I think one, hard, one thing that's making cyber security really hard is because the, the attackers can come from all different ways. So there are so many vulnerabilities, sometimes we don't even know what is the vulnerability. So when we try to defend against all these possibilities, just especially for small private company, we just don't have the resources. So that's why I think information sharing is very important. Once you know what is going on with your peer, then you can just kind of react on the first, at the, uh, right at the moment. And another thing probably also makes more business sense is to wait a little bit to see what's really happening, then try to put your resource into the right spot. Although I know we have a lot of military people here, so maybe that's not the best case for defense. Well, but we, what we see, we do see this. We see if a company has a breach, okay? I hear from uh, CIOs and, and CISOs, Chief Information Security, all the time. You know, the easiest way to get more money is have a, some kind of a breach, okay? So that's what Lay was saying, wait and see. Once they have a breach, boom, they can get money without any, no, no one questions anything, right? Right, and the so, target case. So actually, we actually have written papers on the value of waiting. It's called wait and see. But that's the deferment option. That was from the economics literature I was always publishing in, right? So that we, we applied the deferment option to that very thing. So what's the value of waiting and seeing? We've got one, one back here, and then we'll pull the box up front. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the very informative presentation. I've actually been looked at, looked at the model for quite some time. Oh. Forrest Hare from, uh, by day, SAIC at night, George Mason School of Public Policy, the Shar School. So you had mentioned two kind of classes of um, users of the model, if you will. On one side, you'd mentioned, for example, the targets of the world. On the other side, like a, a nation state. I would suggest for those two classes, it may be fairly easy to kind of codify what their expected loss is. On one side, it's everything. On the other side, it's you know, what's, you know, stock values you mentioned, the, the stockholders, things like that. But I would suggest that in between, there's a very large class, uh, which is I would suggest, you know, ex best example would be critical infrastructure sector, for which there are large negative externalities that are um, induced by underinvesting. And so, have you considered how to extend the model such that you, they can internalize the companies who's making these decisions can inter internalize those negative externalities uh, from a national security perspective? Because ultimately, that is the issue that we need to be working on. Here so, re the the answer is not not really, but we have done something related. Okay, am I okay? Oh. No, so, so we, have, <laughs> we have done something related. So uh, DHS supported us for two and a half years, three years. Uh, and one of the things we came out with was a, a paper on, uh, which was published in the Journal of Cybersecurity, on incentives to do something along the line. And we talked about externalities exactly in there. In fact, that paper won an award from NSA, even though DHS supported it, NSA gave us an award for that paper for its scientific contribution uh, to the literature in cybersecurity. The reason I emphasize scientific, because most people don't think people in a business school or economists doing scientific work like the, the computer science people did. But the answer to your question really is explicitly no, that's a great idea. Uh, send me a note, we ought to get together, and that, that would be a good, a good extension. We talk around it, we talk about, we have papers on externalities, where we, we actually modified our model explicitly to include externalities but we don't exactly address the specific, we have stuff that we've gone around it, but not dead center, at least, would you agree? Or? Yeah. Yeah, so, so the externalities, you know, that's one of the reason we believe firms are underinvesting, right, in critical yeah. infrastructure. On the other hand, we have those papers that, in terms of a chief uh, information officer, if on a personal level, if they have a major breach, they're going to get fired. 
So they, they might have incentive at least to argue for more. Okay. And we see that in things like Target, that you know, when there is a breach, people get fired, even though the company doesn't go bankrupt. Yeah. So r related, to one of the things I didn't, I, I had another slide which I deleted the other day, uh, and the other slide was, uh, why is it so difficult for companies to justify cybersecurity investments relative to many other investments? Well, it's, it's simple. Uh, the name of the game for, for corporations that are publicly traded is revenue growth. And cybersecurity investments for the most part, okay, some people argue you can gain business, maybe in the early years you could, but for the most part they're what we call cost savings or what the government often calls cost avoidance of, of projects. Okay, so if you can invest $10 million okay, to avoid uh, $20 million in costs, the net increase is $10 million, right? Okay, so, but it's a cost savings. The revenue hasn't changed. But if you can invest $10 million to generate 20 million more in revenues, okay, that's what everyone's looking for. Revenue, gro revenue growth projects, hands down, always went out over cost savings in general, unless, unless it's what we call a must-do project. Uh, so there's lots of natural impediments to why it's difficult to justify in many corporations, profit-oriented firms, uh, investments in cybersecurity. What Marty said was externalities is another one. Corporations, they only worry about what we call the private costs. They don't worry about the externalities. Well, the combination of private costs plus externalities is social costs. Everyone talks about social costs, but they, what, what they, don't, they don't realize is it includes the externalities. Private companies, okay, uh, for the most part, don't know, either they don't know how, they don't, they don't take that into consideration. So there's a, you know, we've written papers on, you know, why is it so difficult for firms to actually in, you know, make these decisions to invest more? So I can tell you, Department of Homeland Security, when they were supporting us, they were very concerned about this. There was clear understanding that, uh, on average, it's probably fair to say, it's a generalization, it's hard to prove, because that companies, okay, are under-investing in cybersecurity. But I, I, I can't prove it, but I can tell you, I can give you lots of good reasons why that would be the case. I just add, in, in terms of cost savings, even within the Yep. The oh, category yeah. of cost savings, yeah. cybersecurity is particularly difficult yeah. because after the fact, I mean, you can't measure what you've saved, okay? So if because if, if, there's, if there's no breach, you, know, you have to estimate what, what, what would the loss been if I didn't make this investment? So that's a hard case <coughs> to make. You'll have to forgive me because I'm not an economist. I am a, a cyber practitioner, um, and when I come out to more defense-oriented conferences like this, I try to put on my red team hat. Um, I was going to sort of address the same thing that he did about externalities, um, but more from a, an attacker's mindset. Um, so in the case of your model, if you also have people that are trying to get into your network and get the information within your network, they have some sort of inversion of this model, right? How much should they spend given how much the information is worth to them? In a situation where the information is actually worth more to an attacker than it is to the defender, uh, you know, given a free market, the defender would just sell that information because you now possess information that's worth more to someone else than it is to you. Obviously, that's not tenable in a situation where you're trying to defend your reputation and your organization. Um, so how do you deal with the fact that the same piece of information can be worth different amounts to an attacker versus a defender in the situation. Where is it? I think that's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't get tough with we, 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 don't, we don't have a simple solution, but uh, l let me sort of talk around the question because yeah. I, I don't have a good answer, but I can tell you yeah. that if you remember I, when I opened up, I said originally when I went to Marty Loeb and said uh, we need an economic model, he said I'm not interested. The way I got him interested was very simple. We, the first paper we wrote actually was a game theoretic approach uh, okay, to cybersecurity, exactly your point. It, there's a game going on, right? You're trying to break in and we, we wrote a little paper on it and the way I got him interested, because he is a good method, I said, there's a game theoretic aspect to this. And all of a sudden, you know, the bells went off and he said, oh, there's a mathematical model here. Uh, but we don't have a good, you know, because the problem is that there are different players in the game and you're asking about how would we generalize to all the different players? And, uh, you know, I don't, you, you, and the probability of attack. If you, if you go into this, uh, you're coming the probability of attack. 
Yeah, but, but right. it, would, it, but would differ, it would differ for different but, attackers. That's, but but yeah. we don't have a model, although it's been models, of attacker and defender. And it's a, it's a game that it's, you know. Yeah. But, but yeah. One, once you introduce how much to invest, then there's another another stage. Another stage. Yeah. Right. But you could do it. Right. Right. So I think what, what the hacker gain from the attack, it will be a loss to the society. Right. So if we fully incorporate the externality of the cybersecurity loss from the whole society, maybe we can apply the model. Now yeah. That means everybody, the small business or the private business, they have to consider the whole society loss. So some, someone, since the hacker gained something, then someone else must have lost it, right? So I, I, I encourage you to, to take three minutes, go back on your own, and look at my little video. <laughs> <laughs> so at the, very, so at, at the very end, what do I say? It's not a panacea. It doesn't solve all these problems. Show it to your kids. I, I, granddaughter <laughs> about the bear. It's not a panacea. <laughs> it doesn't solve all the problems, and you know, so, it's just, it's a way to, it, it's, a, it's got a lot of traction to our surprise the way it started off. We didn't realize this was gonna happen. Uh, this is Ming Xia from MasterCard. In my last company, I come from Rad Media. This is AO and Yahoo Merge. And so, you know, follow the data bridge, we apply the NIST security framework. I think this is a good model for total investment. Do you think this model can help it, uh, the city to decide where to invest? In? For example, they have five functions like identify and detect, right? And total have about like more than 800 capabilities. So, you know, even for a larger company, they don't have the total all the functions. You feel like there's some function you don't have level zero, some function have level three. Do you invest the level zero one to, to one or do you invest the, the, you know, from three to four? How do you think this model can help the system make the decisions? Right, why don't you take it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's Got a state question. So, so the, in, you have a total. Are you like talking about the tiers, or just the, where you invest? You're talking, you're talking about the five functions on the core. Yeah. You see, like say for example, I have a, I would like the CFO approve one hundred million dollar to invest in cybersecurity, but uh, you know I have five functions total. Like for example, just the, for simple, just five functions. But some functions, like say identify, I already have you know maybe level three now, but for you know response, I may have level zero now. Do I invest in, uh, you know, more on uh, identify to get a level to three to four, or do I invest more on the, you know, uh, response to the, from level one to level two? Yeah. Well, you know, what's the, you know, loss, right? Because yep. most of all these functions is try to protect yes, the yes. information, right? So, but, uh, so one, one of the things that we have talked about over the last few months Chuck, is that most of the focus of the cybersecurity literature has been on prevention. And recovery is real, so that's, um, I'm gonna use prevention versus recovery. Uh, and recovery is really important. Uh, one of the things I've now come to believe, you know, no matter what you do, you can have 100% security. So what you wanna do is when you think about your optimal investment level, you wanna think about some, I think I'm addressing your question. You wanna think about, so how much do you invest for protection, um, prevention, how much do you invest for recovery? You're, you said you got five functions. But, you know, and so you have to, I don't have an answer for your company. Uh, I know, and we don't have a model for that, but we've been talking about something like that. So I think that's what you're asking. Is that? Right. Right. Okay. So, so, yeah. so I think you're talking about the NIST. So NIST under the core has five, have five functions, right? Actually, a, a small, a uh, consulting firm uh, last month came to see me and I had lunch with them. I, they, they took my offer, come up to campus, I'll buy lunch, all right? And that's, a, they wanted to apply our model to the five functions. I didn't want to tell them the paper we have that's about to come out, okay? But we applied it to the tiers. I think the tiers was a better way to look at it because the tiers tells you, the tiers talks about the, the, the level of sophistication and rigor, okay, that you're gonna put into cybersecurity and it also talks about the cost benefit of moving from tier one to tier two. When you talk about the five functions, they kind of merge together and it's hard, hard to separate them. And I, don't, I didn't see how it would apply as well, but that's what they, they actually wanted to do exactly what you, I think you asked me. 
uh, they were asking, how could you take the model and apply it to the five functions, okay? And I didn't tell them, I, I said it would be tough. I didn't tell them that we've applied it to the tiers because I didn't want them taking my idea. I, I, I'll give it away once it's published. I'm not looking for consulting, okay? <laughs> but, but I didn't want them to take the idea and start writing it up. It's, uh, the person who heads up the company is very smart uh, and it's, you could easily you know, start writing up stuff on this. So, so it, the, the, again, the model predicts an, op, an optimal amount to spend and how it's related to tiers is wherever you are, that's gonna be the tier. But if you wanna move to the next tier, you're going to have to have some additional benefits. Right. And I think the tiers, the benefit of, of the NIST framework and its use in the government is firms are going to see that there's some benefit of moving to the next tier in terms of contracting. And they've got to estimate what that is, you know, getting more government contracts. Or, and that can push them to the next tier. Okay. Okay. I, think I think there was one back. Yeah. Uh, so, isn't there a very big issue around information governance and information asymmetry? So first, from within an organization, uh, the model seems to me to presume at least that an organization has a capability of understanding its own data and understanding the threats to that data. And I know we spoke, er, someone spoke earlier about uh, small and mid-sized businesses. Uh, and I think that the idea of information <laughs> governance and the SMB, you know, vertical, are almost in opposition to each other. Uh, SMBs don't necessarily have that ability or capability to, to engage in that information governance to then do all the tremendous work in the model. And then secondly, isn't there an even more structural information asymmetry between an organization saying, these are the vulnerabilities and threats that I'm aware of and I can defend against, but the criminal coming to break into my system is always looking to expand beyond those known vulnerabilities. You know, operating in the known known is not where cyber actors really want to be. They want to be in the unknown unknowns, or at the very least, the known unknowns. So how do you combat both the kind of internal lack of information governance and the informational asymmetry? Every point you raised I agree with, it's not a panacea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every point you raise is absolutely valid. I agree with you 100%. Uh, and and I, I can't solve it for your company, and, and you're absolutely right. I have to be honest, we, we've been applying it to large companies. We were somewhat surprised when the Better Business Bureau came out with their report and recommended for all small. But what you see with a lot of small companies, they do outsourcing. So one of the things I've recently, actually last week I had a conversation, uh, it seems to me this would be a perfect perfect uh, project for the Small Business Administration to support, okay, the notion of, of helping small businesses figure out some of these questions, right? And maybe, maybe hire some of these consulting firms that do cybersecurity to go out. In other words, Small Business Administration pay the consulting firm to, to pro bono. The small businesses, can't, when you talk about small businesses, many of them are five, let me give you some numbers. At least this is the numbers I was given, but Small Business Administration says that, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Better Business Bureau says 97% of businesses in North America are small businesses. Now, they define small businesses starting off with like uh, zero to five, five to 10. A lot of them are really small businesses. And someone told me, and, I, and you could correct me if this is wrong, that roughly 40% of the GDP, okay, uh, comes from small businesses. Actually, I thought it would be less, but I'm told I was given a number of 42%, actually. Uh, and so what I really think, the, the points you just raised, I agree 100%, they, they don't have the resources to do this. Uh, they don't really know what the value, what, what is it gonna cost them to get a breach. And you need someone who's kind of better trained in that area. And I basically recommend that this would be a great place for small business administration, support consulting firms to pro bono go out and help the small businesses. Trying to get at your, I think I understood your point, your point. So if you got any consulting firms here, I'm on your side. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, didn't want, I don't want to do it. I'm saying this would be a great place to, to basically make a, make a case with the Small Business Administration that you, you support our project and we'll help small companies, okay, based on your money, the government's money. So I think that's really needed. Because what do most small businesses do? They do what people do on their home computer. They, they get online and they download some software. That's what they do, I'm told. 
Can I just wait, sure. make one more yeah. point yeah. before we move on? So uh, I think uh, the model is actually in an ideal situation where you get to decide how much you want to invest optimally. But in most business, you actually receive a budget, just like what you have mentioned. So the whole, I think the most important information <coughs> from the model is you need to identify where's the most uh, profitable function or whatever you call it to spend your next dollar. So, right. Right, right. And sometimes maybe it's the, like the point I was making earlier, maybe it's better to wait for more information to arrive than to start to look at all the front, right? Yeah. Uh, so I guess my question is, um, how portable have you found that 37% number to be? Because it seems like a lot of investments would have sort of that logarithmic, you know, diminishing returns. Um, and uh, and it, but it also seems like within cybersecurity, there'd be some things that are sort of independent, have independent probabilities and costs that you might not want to lump in with all, specifically, you guys say data breaches. You talk a lot about data and the value of data. What about like denial of service attacks? Those are very quantifiable costs um, when they happen and they have quantifiable probabilities of happening, but maybe it's independent of the rest of our cybersecurity costs. How would address that? So I, I you okay. know. So, so my answer would be, I'll go 37. Okay, first of all, 37%, as Marty pointed out, would be the maximum, one over eight, thir maximum. Okay, don't run out and spend 37%, okay, of your expected loss. For most cases, you don't want to spend that much. Okay, and be, you know, so it's, you know, you've got to figure that one out. But don't run out and spend 30, you know, I've had companies say to me, well, should we be spending 37%, you know, and I say, no, no. I say, you got to figure it out. All that, what we were able to show is we came a mathematical solution that the one over E, okay, was a closed form solution that gave us a nice little decision rule. Okay, uh, but that's the maximum. You can't well, run. So companies don't run out and do that. No, <laughs> it's not absolute in the sense that our model is looking at risk neutral. Oh, okay, yeah. so yeah. if it manages and there's lots yeah. of cases where you yeah. you want to be risk averse. Okay, it could be a lot more. And right, you could spend yeah. more. Right. So a PhD the student at Stanford guidelines. in computer science wrote to me and said. Uh, I'm thinking of taking, this is about three years ago, taking your model, okay, and bringing in, a, a, and dropping the assumption of risk neutrality and bringing in risk aversion. And he says, are you interested in writing a paper with me? I said, no, it sounds like an interesting PhD paper. Go ahead and do it. But to me, that was just tweaking our model. But we know, we know what it'll do. You'll spend more. We know, the, we know where they're going to end up, right? Uh, and so I said, well, you know, it was nice to see someone at Stanford wanted to, you know, uh, right, I, I didn't recommend you do it as a dissertation, but it was a nice research paper if you wanted to do it. So, uh, one thing you brought up uh, just a second ago made me think of one other but possible extension or area to look at is, so although I can't imagine anyone in the DOD acquisition leadership of actually having read my dissertation from 10 years ago, but they've begun implementing one of the recommendations, and that is through the as you may be aware that they're now requiring defense contractors to have CMC, CMMC levels that, you know, getting real with uh, required cybersecurity, um, tailored cybersecurity um, levels, if you will, in order to compete for contracts starting right. in the spring. So it's actually, you know, s very specific rules now that are based on kind of the NIST, but may, uh, NIST and the CMMC. So it might be interesting with that being a forcing function now to see if that's actually because that, that level of investment probably exists somewhere on your chart, and if it's a level that's higher than you know, the expected return, there's probably going to be extreme disincentive to really go all the way up to that level, and if it's below, it might speed up to that level and unfortunately keep people from investing up higher. So it might be interested to see how that type of uh, um, contractual requirement may impact their, their, their spending decisions. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. So I'll buy lunch if you come to campus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to find the time to do that now. Yeah. It's a great idea. So uh, on the question of risk aversion or risk tolerance, what about a concept of learned helplessness where businesses aren't accepting risk or they're not averse to the risk, but they kind of live in this world of, yeah, 
very scary. It's very bad. I'm aware of this. My CISO is aware of this. Whoever's responsible for my IT is aware of this. But as an organization, I can't really start wading into the waters because they are so massive and I'm going to drown. So I'm going to play ostrich rather than that. I mean, the, the, it's not a question of allocating risk and kind of tweaking the model. There seems to me a kind of structural incompatibility with traditional notions of economic risk. People are aware, but are being kind of almost like reverse prospecting. They're anchoring themselves away from the risk because it's just too much to deal with at a psychological level. Yeah. You're, you're right, yeah. but I, I, would, I would look at it a little bit differently. I would say most companies, you know, we're talking about cybersecurity here, this is a conference related to that, but that's not why they're in business. Most executives, they don't walk around thinking about cybersecurity unless they're the, CIS, you know, the CISO or the CIO. Uh, they got other things to worry about uh, unless they have a breach, what they were talking. So you're right. I would say for different reasons, you know, this is not on the radar screen, at least in the past. Now it's becoming you know, on the radar screen of all people. Now there's a lot of people arguing it should be moved up to the you know, board of directors because the breaches are so common and potentially, you know, really, you know, costly. And so what I actually, when Equifax, are you all familiar with the Equifax breach? When that happened, so in the classroom I said, I'm not, I don't want to see any company go under. But it looked like that company was really, that was such a breach, this could be it. And this could be the big bonanza we're all waiting for, and everyone's going to wake up. I was wrong. They bounced back. Right? You know, they got other things to do. Now, they should be concerned about it, and other companies are concerned about it, uh, but you're absolutely right. It's not, it's not, it's not the number one priority. You it's know, talk. also it's the basic criticism of economic models. I mean, right? I mean, we, we, we have a lot of assumptions in there that, you know, the decision maker knows all of this stuff. Re remember right. my dancing right. line, right? Economic right. models should be used as a you know, a complement to, not as a substitute for, sound business judgment. And I'm using the word business judgment to mean sound managerial judgment, right? Yeah. Well, I, I think it, we've got uh, a few minutes as we close up. One of the things I'd be interested in hearing is uh, where, where you think that the, the field uh, of, uh, of research is going to be going next as far as uh, the cybersecurity economics. Where do you see it going? Well, one area that's it's definitely going, and, and actually Marty and I wrote probably the first paper in this area in 2003. So if you would have been, you know, if I would have been giving a talk in 2005, I would have told you that cybersecurity insurance, okay, is a fundamental way, okay, of transferring the risk. And I would have said about five more years we'll see cybersecurity insurance really being a mature industry. Today it's becoming a really mature industry, okay? And I see, and it's, it's not, I see one area I see really it moving towards is figuring out ways to transfer the risk through hedging, through cyber insurance. And cyber insurance, in my opinion, is now finally coming of age. Of age. Now, so I say within three to five years, it's going to be mature. I would have said that in 2005, right? But now I really believe it, I think. At least I've got some evidence to say that the, you know, the, the, they're collecting enough data, they need actuarial data. And I think, so in answer to Andy's question, I would say cybersecurity insurance is one of those areas, and it, there's really the economics of transferring it. So well, I have a little- Beyond transferring them too, it's to provide an incentive that these firms, right. instead of standards, they have to have, in order to get a reasonable deductible or to be insured, they have to have certain policies in place. And right. That's okay. one area. An another, another area is that what a lot of you folks may not realize is that one of the things that's given tremendous impetus towards uh, companies being concerned about cybersecurity is the SEC disclosure guidance that originally came out in 2011 and was updated in 2018. So the SEC now uh, is actually on board saying that companies should be disclosing their cybersecurity risk and cyber instances. I'm, I'm, Pleased to report, I was involved when they were coming up with that in 2011. So that's one thing. Another thing, when I testified in front of Congress in 2007, I argued that it would be nice if we could tweak the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, okay, what we call SOX, right? And in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, 
on Section 404, they talk about internal control. Okay, and they talk about the notion of internal control should make sure we have reliable financial reports. Well, I argued in front of Congress in 2007, you cannot have reliable financial reports okay, if you don't have secure information systems, if you're operating in a computer-based environment. Everyone operates in a computer-based environment, so to have reliable financial reports, you need secure computer-based systems, and if they're not reliable, they're not valid. So reliability and validity. And so uh, that's an area where people now, the accounting profession is starting to recognize this, okay? So in 2018, the AICPA, American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, they finally now have gotten on board. When I talk to the accounting firms, okay, we're in an accounting and information insurance department, in 2000, they would say to me, well, cybersecurity is important, and I know that, but that's not what we're really into. Now they're hiring computer science people because they realize, okay, they want, there's an opportunity here. So now they're talking about a cybersecurity reporting system, okay? And so I know my friends in computer science say this when I say it, but who do you think is putting in a large share of the cybersecurity for computer systems in major corporations? It's the auditors, the accounting people. Okay. At first, what they were doing was they'd hire one or two computer science people for maybe you know, 100 audits. Now they're hiring a whole slew of computer science type. Right? And when I would say that to friend, my friends in computer science, they say, that's crazy, and I agree. I think in people with the right kind of computer science background who understand encryption, you know, things like that. I mean, so, yeah. so I gave you a couple areas where, yeah. I guess, not so much specifically cybersecurity, but the relation between cybersecurity and disclosure, related to what you said, that, and, that and the effect, you know, in these annual reports, they have to talk about cybersecurity risks now. And they all do, but but it's boilerplate. You don't learn much <laughs> by reading the annual report. They're saying, you know, unless they have a breach. Yeah. So so, here's the, so if you go if you go to Target, Target had a big breach. You're, you're off two thousand at the end of two thousand thirteen, right? If you look at their two thousand twelve two thousand thirteen, I'm mean, sorry, two thousand twelve ten uh, k, you'll see a couple paragraphs on cybersecurity. Okay. Uh, Companies like Target, retail companies, uh, they, they have, they file theirs on, at the end of January, February 1, okay? So they have through February. Their big breach was in 2013. If you look at their 2013 10K, which goes through, okay, January of 2014, okay, I've added it up, I discuss it in class all the time, okay, in different places, roughly seven pages of the annual report of the 10K are devoted, okay, to, something about their big breach. Come the next year, it went down significantly, and if you look at it today, we're back to kind of standard stuff. So now that's why the SEC's gotten really involved in this. So 2018, they came up with another disclosure guidance by the commissioners, is what they call a commissioner. It's not a regulation at this point. So in 2011, it was the Corporate Finance Division that came up with a disclosure guidance. In 2018, it was the commissioners of the SEC that came out with uh, disclosure guidance. So they're moving in the direction of serious disclosure. And as a, someone who's trained in economics, we hate to say we want to see regulation, but I really think we need, uh, probably being taped here, okay, <laughs> we, we may need more regulation in this area. That's the bottom line. Without it, and I, I always make the analogy of seat belts. Right? You may not like that analogy, but if any of you are, were around when we weren't required to wear seat belts, okay, most people didn't wear them today, and most people didn't want to buy them. Right? Mm -hmm. Option in the car. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you have uh, anything else you want to say as we close? Yeah. I, I guess I, I would say we definitely need more data, like the audience has mentioned. And I think it, it's, it used to be the kind of company doesn't really want to tell us anything. But it is doable because we see insurance companies getting more and more data. They're able to get out more reasonable insurance policy. So I think we definitely, as academics, should move towards that direction. Yeah. Yeah, I should mention one last thing, is that, and that's a GDPR. Okay. Right. The General Data uh, Protection Regulation in Europe 
is really pushing the needle further over, and all other countries are starting to look at it, the U.S. in particular. So I think that's one of the real big developments. Mm -hmm. So if you're familiar with the GDPR, most of you, that's been a real key issue. Mm -hmm. So there are real movements taking place. Anything in closing, Marty? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I thank you very much for, I hope everyone enjoyed the panel as much as I did, and thank the speakers. So.